meet someone. And so, anyway, grab a snack, we'll be starting in a few minutes. Thanks so much. So folks, if you can come in and find an empty seat. There are several tables up here that need uh, events. If you can come in as quickly as possible and take your seat, we'd like to uh, the afternoon. No, I don't have to do that. So welcome to everybody. Uh, my name is Glenn Matoma. I am the director of the College of Daytime Research Center and a faculty member in our Department of Curriculum and Instruction and uh, our Human Rights Institute. Uh, it's my pleasure to welcome you on behalf of the many entities and organizations who rallied to make today's uh, event happen. I do want to start with the land acknowledgement statement. Uh, we'd like to begin by acknowledging the land on which we gather is the occupied territory of the Mohegan, Mashantuck, and Pequot, Eastern Pequot, Skadabook, Golden Hill, Pagasset, and Mitmah peoples who have stewarded this land throughout the generations. We thank them for their strength and resilience in protecting this land and aspire to uphold uh, our responsibilities according to their example. Um, and uh, I just like to, uh, we're going to transition quickly because we have a lot to get through today, but I think it's important to frame this conversation in terms of actually that last point that's made, upholding our responsibilities. Uh, the last time I was up and looking at a beautiful crowd of, uh, of people was a couple of weeks ago when we handed out the 2019 Thomas J. Dodd Prize in International Justice and Human Rights. 
uh, to Brian Stevenson. And uh, some of you were there um, for what was a truly remarkable and transformative event. And among the things that he told us that night um, were things that stuck with me. And it was a frame for how we understand moving forward with the essential work of addressing the legacy of white supremacy and racism in our country and in our country. And he had four basic points, four basic messages for us uh, to keep in our minds as we move it forward. And, uh, and tonight, I think, really embodies all four of those themes. The first was about proximity, being proximate to the people in pain and suffering the worst consequences of the structures and systems of oppression that are operative among us to not flee from them, but to be near them in their moments of pain. The second was about the importance of changing the narrative, changing the stories we tell ourselves about our common past and about the world we live in. And I take that in part to mean to start to tell narratives that are true, that are authentic, that reflect the various realities and experiences of all members of our communities. The third part was about being uncomfortable. Right? To not simply fall back into spaces and places where we can surround ourselves by the people who look and think and act like us and who can confirm our perspectives and our biases or who make life easier for us uh, to simply look through but to deliberately put ourselves in situations where we're forced to confront things that we just assume not, or that bring us discomfort about who we are and about our own histories. That in embracing that discomfort is where growth and transformation happen. And the last point that he shared, and I think this is really important for us tonight, is to remain hopeful. To remain hopeful in the face of a long and difficult structure that when you tally up the scoreboard has as many losses as it does wins oftentimes. And that can feel like you're rolling the, uh, the boulder up the hill only to have it come back down again. And that in that hope to maintain our hope first for ourselves and what we can do and grow, but also to remain hopeful in each other to be open to the possibility that others will surprise us with their own growth and their own change. And if we have hope in ourselves and each other, then ultimately we have hope for our communities and where our communities can come. And so framing tonight about those things and about our efforts as a community to grow in hope with one another, I think is the point of the God Center's involved in this. So um, I'm grateful for you all to be here. I'm especially grateful for our very brave uh, panel of amazing members of the Yukon community who are up here today, and to uh, our two key facilitators, um, uh, Dominique and Brendan, who will introduce themselves in, in, in a second. But mostly I'm grateful to all of you right, for coming out late in the semester on a cold and drizzly day to be uncomfortable, to get proximate, to change the narrative, and to have them. So, thank you. Thank you very much, It's great to see everyone, and I hope you're doing well. My name is Brendan Kane, and I'm the History Department, and I'm also the Director of the Dot Center's Democracy in Dialogues Initiative, and it's my great pleasure to welcome you. And I just wanted to say a couple of quick words to frame the specific dialogue that we're about to enter into, and this is not a debate. Right? This is not an argument, this is an opportunity to talk about a series of questions that are critical not only to us individually, but also to us as a community, but then also much, uh, much larger as we look nationally and even internationally. And so I have a slide up here uh, right now, which is um, uh, the landing page for the Democracy and Dialogues initiative through the Dot Center. And part of the point to this is to try to create spaces for a dialogue across difference and also dealing with difficult questions, having the difficult conversations. So we invite everyone who is interested to be in touch with us if you'd like to be involved. Um, but it's not just from a staff and faculty position that we do uh, this work and we brought this together this evening. It's our really sort of humble uh, 
kind of position to be doing this dialogue in the wake of what was a really powerful and beautifully organized and well attended event uh, this morning, the or early this afternoon, the March of Solidarity. And so here are a couple pictures from just a few hours ago. And as we start out today, uh, I should quickly say that this is not supposed to be a one-off. This is supposed to be an opportunity for us as a community, as individuals, to start having, with intentionality, the conversation about race and racism within our community. And so this evening what we're going to do is we're basically going to have two dialogues, part one, part two. And part one is going to be with those of us on the stage. And we're going through... Uh, so you can see the program. The round one will be starting out on an individual level. So there's a part to our conversation today. So we will start out talking about individuals' experiences with race, ethnicity, and racism. From there, then we'll branch out to talk about how those questions affect us as we live in our communities. And so we'll think about social settings, and there we will go through a couple case studies. Round three, then, is really critical. This is the moment when the folks who are up on stage will be asked to describe what they envision the university that they wish to be a part of is, and what are the kinds of moves, and changes, and tasks that must be undertaken in order to see that university come about. Um, and then, after that, after the turn of the hour, it's going to turn over to all of you, and you're going to do exactly the same uh, rounds. And I just want to say very quickly before I hand it over the, the microphone, round one is a moment when everyone who's taken part in the dialogue has the floor for two minutes to themselves. So at two minutes, you're talking, we ask you to stop. But if you can only speak for 30 seconds, you have nothing else to say. This is not a moment for people to jump in because it's important not only to speak and to listen, but also to reflect. And then the last two rounds are going to be open. And with that, I turn it over. I have one. <laughs> Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, yep. great. Hi, everyone. My name is Dominique Bell Lawson. I'm an academic counselor at the EX School of Education. I am a graduate of the EX School of Education and elementary education, and I returned there in this work in my capacity. Part of my work is recruiting students, students of color, and supporting students of color there because the state of Connecticut has less than 8% of teachers of color and well over 40% of students of color. So that's really how my role began there, and I want to give everyone the opportunity to introduce themselves as well. Thank you, Dominique. I'm Tom Katsoulias, the 16th president of the University of Connecticut. I'll leave with that for now. <laughs> my name is Steve Nunez, and I'm a philosophy, uh, a graduate student in the philosophy department. Mark Kovarabinakis, the campus director of Uganda and professor of history and Latino and American studies. I'm Avalyn Nieves. I'm an undergraduate student here studying how and health sciences. Um, and I'm also the elections and outreach commissioner for the undergraduate student government. Hi, everyone. I'm Ellie Doherty. I'm the associate vice president and dean of students at UConn. Hello everyone, I'm Trisha Ann Hawthorne-Noble and I work in the athletic department specifically within the Student Athlete Development Office. Hi everyone, I'm Andrew King, Associate Director of Women Relations for the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences UConn Foundation and I'm also a 2015 Political Science grad of the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences. Um, hi everyone, Kazem Kazerunian, the School of Engineering, Dean of the School of Engineering. All right. Before we get started, we want to set the ground rules. So, there is as follows. Be respectful, hold the rule, treat others the way you want to be treated. Everyone gets to be heard. Share airtime. Don't monopolize the time. One person speaks at a time. Speak for yourself, not others. If you're upset or offended, say so. Or say why. If you disagree, disagree. But disagree with the common, not the person. Stick to the issue. No name calling, no book downs. That's for you too. Everyone helps the facilitators keep the conversation going. Personal stories stay in the dialogue group. Unless we agree, it is okay to share with others without giving names. Okay, we're going to begin with round one. 
Now everyone will be given 10 minutes to speak. I'm going to take this time to give you an opportunity to read the questions along with me that you will be speaking up. I'll ask the panel to not stop this conversation, meaning you have to jump in and talk to others so that we can each give the floor to that person. So no interruptions. All right. When did you first realize that people come from different racial or ethnic backgrounds? Tell a story or give an example of how your background or experiences have affected your ideas about racism or other racial and ethnic groups. Take a minute. Do I have any brave souls to start? Thank you, Dominique. Uh, before I start with the answer to this question, I do want to add some personal thanks to the co-sponsors of this event, to Donate you for moderating, Brendan, you for moderating, uh, Glenn, uh, and the Dodd Center for co-sponsoring this event with the, with the Office of the President. Thank you very much. And thank you all for coming. And to underscore Brian Stevenson's comment, he really gave us a roadmap uh, for how to bring about change. And it was about, one of the four items was, having comfort with uncomfortable uh, and disagreeable conversations about the realities. And he, he also spoke about hope, and he gave two really extraordinary examples I wanted to mention. One is uh, uh, post-Nazi Germany and post-apartheid South Africa, and how confronting the realities really changed those societies. He gave us hope, a roadmap for changing society in America. Now, now to the question, I think when I first realized that people come from different racial and ethnic backgrounds, I remember being, you know, it was born in, in the late 50s, I remember being a five-year-old and, and watching on TV race riots in Alabama and Montgomery and um, particularly seeing the freedom marches and the speeches of Martin Luther King. I, I suppose I probably saw the I Have a Dream speech, but at five I didn't really remember what the speech was about. But I do remember asking my mother about why was all this happening. And, and she explained that it was because people have different color and they're not treated properly because of the color of their skin. And I couldn't understand why then, and I still don't understand why now. Um, how, how my background experiences affected my views about racism. You know, I, I grew up in uh, Southern California in a pretty um, homogeneous school of neighborhoods, so I didn't have a lot of uh, exposure. And, and uh, meanwhile, in, in Southern California's relatively forward-looking compared to the rest of the nation, but, but um, I came to find later that there was white flight in certain neighborhoods, uh, that there was, that the racism was more subtle. Um, then then um, over the course of time, we, you know, we saw the, the positive movement of the civil rights movement in the 60s, and it was easy to begin to think that there was real progress. I think the ubiquitous popularity of, of Oprah and the election of Obama uh, made us think that we had made some progress towards the post-racist world. And I think all of that bubble was burst by the, the, um, the advent of the cell phone, really, and uh, the uh, ever-present videos of what really was going on, and you sort of realized that was not the case. And, um, and then it really came home to me when I was at Charlottesville, August 11th, and uh, we, the university experienced um, the, the first attack, I, I think, of um, domestic terrorism, domestic domestic terrorism camouflaged as free speech, and that had a profound effect on me. And I guess my, my two minutes are up. <laughs> um, so I'll try and maybe collapse these two questions to into. Uh, to one answer. So for some, I think I'll give some context for my own personal experience and my own story. So I was born and have continued to be someone who is, crosses multiple borders, national borders, linguistic, religious, ethnic, racial borders. Uh, I grew up, I was born in the United States, but I grew up uh, in Canada, in Western Canada, the son of a Mexican immigrant and, uh, and uh, a white father from Ohio. Um, and that profoundly shaped me um, in my experience growing up in Vancouver. Vancouver, back in the, in the 70s and 80s, was growing up was increasingly emerging and becoming a city um, that would ultimately today become the most uh, quote, Asian city proportionally in the world outside of Asia. 
Um, that in, in, in combination with the fact that my father grew up a, a missionary kid in China and speaks fluent Chinese. So I, I grew up in this racial mixture and this, this sense of being never at home and always at home in multiple spaces. You know, I would go to Mexico, I would go to Chicago where I was born. We have, we have families and different family, different places there. So um, I, would, I was always trying to negotiate with this. So I think the answer is my first realization was that I was someone from different racial and ethnic backgrounds and always trying to negotiate that. Um, and even in school in Vancouver, and I think the kind of socio uh, kind of cultural context of Vancouver where there was a real absence of Latinx, uh, certainly Chicano uh, students and people. It was either you were either white or Asian. And people always tried to slot me in as a kind of funny looking Asian guy. Um, and that obviously didn't fit. And so then there was that or I was sort of the spick in a kind of playful racist way of, of, of students in my elementary and high school. So playing that and then um, being with, with family in, I was never Pilsen enough in Chicago or never Cherry Creek enough in Denver, so tr always trying to kind of figure that out. Um, so my experiences are actually pretty similar uh, to, to yours because I am um, also uh, from multiple different ethnic backgrounds. Um, my mother is an immigrant from Jamaica and my father is from Puerto Rico and his entire family. Um, so I've always kind of grappled with uh, both sides of that. Sometimes they coincided, but oftentimes they would c collide and clash as well. Especially, you know, on my mom's side of the family, um, I was always the lightest one in terms of complexion. So I'd always, you know, kind of noticed that growing up. But then on my father's side, I'm the darkest one and I have really curly hair. And that was always something that I get picked at as well. So that was like kind of when I realized that there were different racial and ethnic backgrounds. But I wouldn't say it was necessarily like a bad thing a bad one, I, I guess, in a, in a sense. Um, in terms of how it's affected my ideas in, of racism, um, one in story in particular definitely deals with my mother. I was raised by my mother, who is a black woman who is of darker complexion than me. Um, so whether it be when she'd pick me up from school and my teachers would be like, oh, who's that? Is that your mother? Because people like just assume that she wasn't because she was a darker woman. I remember people would always ask me if she's my nanny or my babysitter. Um, she's my mother. Or an, another time that really stuck out to me is uh, I was in middle school or high school. I'd say middle school. Um, we were just at Target or Walmart just shopping for makeup. Um, and my mother really struggled just to find like a shade of foundation that even fits her, which is very easy for most, you know, lighter skin, even for me. And I, I would see my privilege in that. I would easily be able to find a foundation shade for myself. My mother constantly would have to struggle and I would like see the pain in her face how she just can't go to run to the store really quick to just pick up makeup. So I know it sounds very, like, not that big of a deal, but it really kind of goes far in terms of how racism really is embedded in this country and just in the world as a whole, and even just kind of growing up and being surrounded by tons of different racial and ethnic backgrounds um, definitely kind of made my realization. So I've had enormous privilege in my life. And one of those opportunities that has come from that is being able to go to um, a very special high school um, in the woods of rural northern Michigan um, that has students from all over the world. And um, I loved the opportunity of going there and also realized that the community around us um, did not have access to sort of the globalization of the student body that I had at my high school. And so um, we started a program where I would, you know, my friends and I would go to various elementary schools and just talk about the countries that they were from, um, which was something we really enjoyed doing. And one day we went to an elementary school down the road, and my, my dearest friend who is from South Korea but was living in Saudi Arabia at the time um, talked about her Korean background. And I want to say the elementary school was 98% um, white. And at the end of the session, this woman comes forward with this little girl um, who is Asian. And the woman says, this is my daughter. I've, you know, we've adopted her and she's never seen anyone from Asia before. And so it's so important that she meet you. 
And uh, my friend was very reluctant and uncomfortable around um, the mother and her daughter. And I said, Sung, what, what, what is it? What's wrong? And she said, she's from South Korea, and the mom put her in Chinese dress. Yeah. And that was such a heartbreaking moment, and it raised so much awareness for me um, of how much love was in that room and in that moment, and yet how much... Um, harm was coming to the uniqueness of identity that was in that room as well. Uh, and that has always stayed with me. Um, what has also stayed with me to, to get at the second question is I was very young in my career, probably, I was probably 23 years old, and I was working at the University of Michigan. Go Blue. And at the time, they were going through some affirmative action lawsuits that eventually made its way to the Supreme Court, and they won one and lost the other, and I was working in undergraduate admissions. So this was active litigation going on. And I would, I like the background. <laughs> and I, you know, I would, I, would, uh, I would present to rooms like these of, you know, parents who loved their children and wanted them to go to Michigan, and in almost every situation, um, an individual who was almost always white would stand up and say, I don't even know why I'm here. You're not going to admit my son because he's white. And I couldn't believe that there was so much hate and distrust and a lack of understanding of just the value of diversity in our world and that we are all better for that. Um, and that is still present today. There is still a lot of that sentiment in the conversations that I have in my role as Dean of Students, in my role as a mother, um, in my role as a community member. And uh, that stays with me, both of those experiences. I first realized the different racial and ethnic backgrounds. I was born and raised in Jamaica. Uh, that's where I've been my entire life, for up until I was about 13, 14 years old. There in Jamaica, the, it's not really about race, it's still more, more so about class. So it's more about where you're from, because I did have you know, friends who are Chinese or Puerto Rican or Dominican or Haitian, but that didn't matter to me. I didn't understand my color mattered. When I migrated to the States, we moved into a quote-unquote white neighborhood in Westchester, New York, and I remember moving in, our neighbors called the cops. You know, like, hey, there are people that are over there, they don't belong here. And for a long time, I tried to figure out, what do you mean I don't belong here? Like, we own, we own this house. We bought this house. We're here. We belong here. Then um, for a very long time, it continued. You know, we're, we turned into drug dealers. We turned into whatever names they could figure out to try to rationalize why we were in that neighborhood because we didn't belong. Ironically, the school that I went to was probably a mile away, and it was predominantly black and brown students. Um, so I really struggled with what do you mean I don't belong? And then there were certain situations where I'm black, but because I'm Jamaican, there was some type of difference that occurred, and I'm still trying to figure out why there's a difference, because color is color. Um, so that's when I first realized. But my part of telling a story to give an example of how your background or experiences have affected ideas, I wouldn't really say ideas. Uh, for me, it's reality. For me, it's experiences. For me, it's the fact of the matter that I have experienced racism probably throughout my entire life, and I didn't have a name to it for a long time. We talk about racial microaggressions and unconscious biases. When those things go unchecked, it can turn into racist acts. So I've been experiencing it for a long time. Whether it's being pulled over, whether it's you know, worried about my husband, worried about my brothers, making sure that they have everything not in the, the glove compartment, but in a little area that if a cop pulls you over, we need to be prepared for these things. And I have a daughter, so I, I, I'm more concerned also about her future and all those things, and I, you know, how has affected me? It's affected me because it's an everyday thing. So when I wake up and I look in the mirror, that's something I have to consider. How am I going to present myself today to not fit into a norm? And what is norm at this point? Because you know, for the longest longest time, I was always ashamed of you know of being Asian, of being Korean. Because just growing up, you know, I thought it was something that made me different. I knew it was very different from from an early age. I always thought it was a bad thing because of the way I was treated, and you know, not necessarily in school. I mean, I was fortunate enough that my parents, because of their experiences uh, growing up, 
you know, immigrating here from South Korea and having such bad experience in school, they, they wanted to make sure that they protected me from that and they sent me to a uh, Catholic school and to an extent, you know, I was protected. But, you know, once I left that atmosphere of, of comfort, you know, I, I do remember when I was in middle school and I was in the mall walking and randomly someone came up to me and said, get out of my way, Chink. And, you know, they were laughing with their friends about it. You know, that's when it really hit me that I am different and, you know, it's something that I always, I always thought I was ashamed of. And it was really when I came to UConn and I met some really fantastic people, uh, people that are in this room that really mentored me and, and made me realize that my identity, my South Korean identity is something I should be proud of. It's a part of who I am. And, you know, I, I'm really proud of it and, and I try every day to, to make sure that people know that I'm proud of that because for so long I was ashamed of it and now because it's so ingrained of who I am, I'd like to say that. So let me see where I want to start. Um, so my dad's from Santiago, Re Dominican Republic, and my mom is a white woman. I call her Clear. Um, <laughs> so that is sort of my first introduction into race and ethnicity is sort of just being born um, into a world. But uh, my dad grew up in Washington Heights uh, after he moved here, and my mom grew up in Binghamton. So I was born, they met at a bowling alley or some shit. And, like 1987. Um, so uh, they split up when I was like two years old and I moved to Wilmington, North Carolina whenever I was four. So um, Wilmington has shaped and molded me into a certain sort of way and really, really shaped the way that I see um, race in the United States. So November 10th um, this year was the anniversary, the 121st anniversary of the only coup d'etat in American history that occurred in Wilmington, North Carolina. Um, this year is the first year, in fact, that the state of North Carolina recognizes it as a coup. Um, so in the 1890s, Reconstruction was working in southeastern North Carolina, which is something that I think we don't talk about enough, um, which sparked this. So uh, there's a lot of black excellence in Wilmington, and the history of Wilmington is fraught with race, racist terrorism. Um, I don't like the term racial terrorism because it's very much racist. Um, so growing up in Wilmington as a biracial Dominican in a world that doesn't understand what that means uh, made me think about race in a, a certain sort of way. I went to Williston Middle School, which was in 1923 the first accredited black high school, the, the first Jim Crow high school um, recognized by the state of North Carolina. Um, so actually 2018, last year, was the 50th anniversary of the closure of Williston Industrial High School, which I consider um, epistemicide. Uh, so black education was sort of strangled out of Wilmington, very literally. Um, and we can see that through a case of the Wilmington 10 and so forth. So Wilmington, North Carolina has always shaped the way that I think about um, race. And I guess we'll kind of get up to that as it's sort of chiming in. But uh, it's also made me recognize the different ways in which race operates and racism. Um, I've come to call it racism, race parentheses-ism, because whenever we talk about race, we don't ever talk about the white supremacist logics that were there in sort of creation of the racial categories in the first place. But um, the ways that these manifest are different in different parts of the country, and I think that that's an important part of the conversation um, as we continue throughout the day. Hi. Um, I'm a political refugee. I, uh, my wife and I were granted political asylum in 1980, a couple of years after the Iranian Revolution. We didn't enter the country as um, political refugees. We entered the country as foreign students. But after the Iranian Revolution in 1978, and a lot of you were not even born then, um, we, um, no, we were politically active against the current regime in Iran, and we lost our citizenship with the Iranian government, not having the papers and everything that requires of, of the foreign students. We had to seek political asylum. And becoming that then very interesting times, because of being a Muslim, being an Iranian, during the hostage crisis um, in Chicago, where were some interesting times we had to introduce ourselves here and there as Turkish students or, or Greek students. And, and it was funny when we went to a Turkish restaurant and the guy, is, we didn't know it was Turkish, and we introduced ourselves as Turks and they started talking Turkish to us. <laughs> but uh, it, 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 um, 
having, having the Chicago accent that they have, you now it takes you through, through interesting, interesting um, stories. I can share a story with you. But before that, I shared with you that a couple of days ago, a friend put the phrase microaggression for me in a very interesting context that I understood for the first time, compared it to dripping water on, on a rock. And eventually, it, it leaves a dent. And you need to learn how to deal with that and turn it around. And uh, because you can't go through life um, believing that, no, you're not liked and you can't have so you have to turn it around and deal with it. But, but the story, um, because they asked for a story, a couple of days, a couple of years ago, I hurt myself in racquetball, walked into a um, clinic in, in Willimantic, a walking clinic, and, and doctor didn't actually want to engage me. Uh, he was describing to the nurse whatever, after examining me, what I need to, be, to, to get done, MRI or x-ray. And I was puzzled, I asked, what? because I didn't think that I had damaged myself that much. And he turned around and said that. So he pointed to my bones and said, bone doctor, bone doctor. Which actually, it was funny for me. He made assumptions and he had to describe to him that, by the way, I have a biomedical engineering department. <laughs> and, and, and it was, but um, you, again, you, you need to, to learn how to put these, those things in a positive way and turn it around and um, deal with that. Thank you very much, everyone. As we move into our second round, as, as we described before, the idea is to move from the individual into thinking about how those individual experiences affect us in the collective. And uh, we've already heard a little bit of um, how in individuals have interacted with their communities. And here we'll do it a little bit more intentionally and specifically. And so what we have here is a series of nine case studies. And they're just kind of imaginative case studies, but uh, by no means unbelievable. And these are put together by our partners and friends, Everyday Democracy, uh, which is a group centered in Hartford. And so what I'm going to do is ask all of our guests on the stage, and I have, you can, look at that, a little preparation, um, to ask each of you to read as we just go down the line, then I'm going to ask you, just invite you to reflect for a minute, and then ask a couple questions about which of these case studies, if any, speak to you, and if so, in what ways. So, Kaz, if I could start with you, and if you could just read number one, and then Andrew, and then... A Latina speaks English with an accent. She feels that her co-workers co co don't take her seriously. In one diverse neighborhood, families struggle to make ends meet. People who just came from other countries move in. They get lots of attention and help from the community. The longtime neighbors are angry because their own needs aren't being met. An African-American couple tells their children to be extra careful at the shopping mall. They remind the children to stay together. They also tell them to keep their receipts for everything they buy. The leaders of a local multicultural annual fair are upset. They invited a community member of Sioux descent to perform a native ceremony, but he refused. After a terrorist attack in the, is in the news, a man who is from the Middle East cancels his travel plans. He's afraid of being bullied by airport guards. A loan officer at a local bank often refuses to make loans to people of color. This happens even when they have good credit ratings. A white couple is walking to their car after seeing a late movie. They see a group of young black men coming towards them. Uh, the couple crosses the street. On an internet chat, Chat room, a group of students makes racial insults about a classmate. A man enters a neighborhood store. He feels that the manager, who is from a different ethnic group, is keeping an eye on him. He thinks the manager doesn't trust him. Okay, if I can just invite you to take a minute to reflect on those, and Glenn, if you could. So here are some prompt questions. You can take any of them, or you can go in a different direction if you wish, and they are as follows. 
Which cases stand out for you and why? Why do you think the people in the case studies you chose acted the way they did? Did the case studies resonate with you because you see similar things occurring in your community? So whenever we're ready, I'll hand the microphone over to a volunteer. And again, this will be open, so speak for a little bit. And again, just trying to be mindful of time. And uh, when you're done, hand it to someone else. Who would like to go? So there were three that struck me right away. Um, and one was case five. So I um, was in Manhattan on 9-11 during the attacks. And to me, this became the norm in New York City for a period of time, that um, we had labeled an entire ethnicity and identity as being scary. And it happened overnight. And one of the things I just think of so strongly when looking at that case is how dramatically things changed in my world on that day and how in particular um, a certain identity that I cared for automatically became, it seemed, ostracized and feared by the greater community and the work we had to do to recover as a city from that and as individuals. Um, and then case seven also speaks to me. I've, I've lived in a lot of urban environments. I've lived in Harlem, I've lived in various areas of Manhattan, I've lived in the south side of Chicago. That seems to be a theme, by the way. Um, and the beauty of living in urban environments is the, is the difference that you see every day. And yet we can approach that by making eye contact and saying hello, or by crossing the street. And um, that hits home with me as well. And then um, case eight is very true. And it's, it's true for our community here. And when I see incidents like these in my role as Dean of Students, um, every time I want to bring the students in and I want to print out the exchange and I want them to look at each other and see if they could actually say these things to another person if they looked at them in the face. Um, and I don't think they would. And so I, I think about eight all the time in the work that I do. A few of them definitely uh, resonate with me. And case three for sure talks about the African-American couple. I see myself doing this now to my niece, um, you know, friends that I may have to say, you gotta stay together, uh, make sure that you do have your receipts for everything because you don't wanna be accused of anything. And I definitely foresee myself doing this for my daughter. And the question that was asked here is, you know, why would we act in this way? And the reality is, the reality that I live in I have to make sure that we're able to protect ourselves on all levels at all times. So, you know, it may not happen. We may go into a store and no one may follow us. No one may ask for anything. But in the event that it does, we have to be prepared. Everything is systematic and is, is set up in a way where it's going to make it a little difficult to prove myself or whoever it is um, within my family that I'm telling, hey, make sure you, you can prove that you can afford this, that you can do these things. Off of that one, it's uh, case six. I recently bought a house and it was so difficult to just get over barriers that I thought shouldn't even be there. Uh, we were questioned regarding everything in my entire life. I felt like I was in an interrogation. Where did you get this money from? How long have you been working at UConn? Where did you get this from? So I felt as if we were being asked more questions. We were given interest rates that were higher than they should have been, but if we didn't have access to understand that this is unfair, we probably would have ended up paying a lot more. So that's another um, why people do that. Uh, they have assumptions, particularly, that's just my assumption, that there may also be assumptions, and definitely unconscious bias that is just not checked. Following that, I'm sorry, I'm gonna take up a whole bunch of time because there's too many on this. Um, uh, case seven, white people walk into a car, I've been with my husband and my brothers, right? So when Jamaicans walk around, we just get loud sometimes when we're talking, but we're just happy. We're just talking and you can't understand what we're saying, but we're just happy people. Um, and sometimes to someone else it may come off as, wow, they're being aggressive, who are these individuals? And I have seen people hold their bags tighter, run into their cars, go into the store, and you have to wonder, when did I become a criminal? When, when did I become a suspect that I can come and harm you or steal from you? So those things I have definitely witnessed. And the last one is a man enters a store, case nine. 
I've been followed in a store and um, I can be very vocal. Individuals who know me, I can be very vocal. So I do say something if I do see myself or someone following me in a store. And I oftentimes tell them like, hey, I'm not here to take anything. I'm actually here to help you to buy something so that we can all have, you know, go home, have a paycheck and I'll be happy. And I probably don't use those exact words, but you know, at the end of the day, I'm like, stop following me because, and I don't understand why you are. Again, why am I labeled a criminal, a thief, or whatever it is that you have in your mind? And it comes down to that ingrained stuff that's just not dealt with. So I did want to talk about case one in particular. So uh, I'd like to flip this on its head and say, so an Asian woman speaks English with an accent. She feels that her coworkers don't take her seriously. So this is something that I... I've experienced because uh, my mom, she is an immigrant from South Korea and she does have an accent and she's tried so hard and she's done some amazing things in her life. So I'd like to use her as an example. She'd be embarrassed about this, but uh, no, whenever should we go out somewhere to a restaurant or something, you know, she does have an accent. It's not as visible, but you know, people pick up on it and people recognize that. And it's something that she deals with. And, you know, growing up, it was something that I was also embarrassed about because, you know, that also something that makes me feel different. You know, it makes me stand out having parents that, you know, that don't speak fluent English or have, have an accent while they speak English. But now, you know, it's gotten to the point where that's, like I mentioned earlier, that's part of our identity. You know, she's tried so hard. She owns her own tutoring business. She teaches English and, you know, she taught her friends English. And, you know, she came to the States and taught herself English and she went through so much and she's done such amazing things in her life. So, you know, don't ever be judging someone else for the, the way that they're speaking English because you have no idea you know, what they have gone through to get to that level, right? And so just be cognizant of that. And so that one really, really stood out to me. My, my, my one relates directly with this. So our mothers, I wish they would have met. Uh, that this is my mother too in exactly the same experience that because of her accent, I mean, I'll, I'll quickly say, I think language is a proxy for race, right, in a lot of different ways, and, and, and therefore for racist practice. So my mother, um, who had to learn English like your mother and had to struggle, and I also have the same shame and guilt about that with my friends, and she would speak and they wouldn't understand her and make fun of the way she would speak. Um, and so she, and she wasn't allowed into certain um, institutions or clubs, etc. And one, one, story so I'm I speak only Spanish to my kids and this is coming for a circle because my mother taught me Spanish um, as my first language and I was speaking in uh, it's happened more than once in a supermarket and some woman behind me and I was holding was with one of my kids a three-year-old at the time said I hope you are teaching him English um, and again it was this moment of you know of all the things that you're talking about that we're here to talk about today A couple of them jumped out at me for recognition of things I've seen in society, case two and case nine in particular. Case nine really reminds me of the post-Katrina um, uh, news, news stories uh, on implicit bias where they depicted um, a white group wading out through the floods carrying food and, say, and the, the caption was, you know, survivors struggle to survive amid the flood. And then a black group, the same picture, carrying food, and the, the caption is, you know, um, uh, I forget what the, the term was, but it was um, people uh, pillage, you know, looters, uh, you know, and, and uh, steal, right? And so the, the, um, the implicit bias that's framed by um, each of the observers um, the case two one really mortifies me because it sort of uh, personifies um, the xenoph xenophobia um, and uh, the basis for some of the, um, the hate that we see in America today, especially those disenfranchised who swung the last presidential election, right? Um, really, I mean, it's a group who feel um, left behind and then uh, develop a, a really a hate and a resentment of others and blame their being left behind on, un, you know, unfairly 
uh, on others. I, it, to me, it speaks of the misconceptions that uh, underlie bigotry and racism. So that's what I see in number two. I, I'm, I'm sorry to quick interrupt. Um, Tom, I understand you need to, to leave. And are you doing, you're doing okay? Great. Steve? Yeah, I could talk a, a length, at length about probably all these, but um, I'll hit nine and then five. Uh, yeah, I think one of the biggest reckonings to coming to to my perspective of race in America was um, I've always told my mom that I've had my mom again, just to remind y'all, it's clear, uh, she's super white. Um, and uh, we were walking through a, a store. I was home for uh, winter break or something. We were walking through a store, and I picked up a, a bottle of cologne, and we got followed through the store. And throughout my whole life, I've always told my mom, like, hey, I'm different than you, and people treat me different than you by the way that I am in the world. And it wasn't until she got followed with me in a department store that she looked at me and said, you know we're being followed right now. And I said, mom, this is a normal occurrence. I've told you this many a times. And it was like, for me, it felt like the first time that she ever recognized, like, oh, shit, he's telling the truth. Um, and that, I think, was probably the most hurtful thing. Um, that I realized about white America is that they can't experience it, so it's hard for them to comprehend the microaggressions and shit that non-white people have to deal with on a day-in, day-out basis. Um, and then number five hits really, really close to home uh, because as a poor kid growing up in, in the South, I enlisted in the military and got my Green Beret at 20 years old as a Special Forces weapons sergeant to fight the war on terror. Um, and throughout my time, about 21 months in Afghanistan, I started realizing the way that Islamophobia was weaponized and sort of always the underlying cause of conflict and strife. And uh, after I got out of the Army, I became a personal security specialist driving around congressional delegations uh, out of the embassy at Ka in Kabul. And I realized that Islamophobia was like the literal one category that, that people were really, really concerned with, um, which drove me to asking questions like, Damn, I've been in this country for 21 months, and I don't know a fucking thing about Islam, about Muslims, about this part of the world. Um, and it made me start to question how deep racism and white supremacy um, sort of drive American public policy. And that drove me back to, to going to uh, get my undergrad, where I, I went to UNCW, and my question about Islam and Muslims and Islamophobia and... Muslims as a racialized category post-2001 that I don't think begins in 2001, but begins with the collapse of the Soviet Union, um, and particularly Sam Huntington's clash of civilizations in 1993. I don't think it is one off in 2001, but it really, really made me start to think about the ways that this white supremacy is sort of always the implicit operating thing in American public policy, which led me to study this um, to this day, um, studying Africana philosophy and sort of racialization as a phenomenon, particularly in the United States. But yeah, I think that the, the example of the TSA um, is a perfect example of the sort of militarization and, and racialization of Muslims in the United States that hits a lot of the different ways that race intersects with gender, class, um, ethnicity, and so forth. Um, but yeah, we could go into any of the, I could you talk your ear off, so I'm gonna go ahead and yield my time. So very quickly, case number five. Case number five, um, some of you may remember when President Clinton visited uh, Yukon to, um, I think it was for Dot Center. And at the time, on the day, um, my wife who has fought against fundamentalism all her adult life was asked by her boss to stay home for security. Um, yeah, so a lot of these I could totally, again, speak on forever um, as they affect me and people that I know, but the ones that really stuck out to me the most would be four and nine. Um, so on a more personal level, in terms of case nine, I know a lot of us have been talking about it, um, but oh, this happened very recently, over the summer even. Um, I went to a hair store, so for those of you all that might not know like what a hair store is, um, it's a place where a lot of women, specifically black women, go to get hair products that are more catered to our own hair. Um, braiding hair, whenever we add in braids, locks, anything into our hair. I'm, I love changing up my hair. Anyone that knows me knows I have a new hairstyle like every day. 
Um, so I go to hair stores a lot, and I grew up in a community where there were hair stores in great abundance. I could walk to one for my house. Um, but moving here to Yukon in Cowtown, middle of nowhere, um, I have to drive 30 minutes to Hartford, um, where to the nearest hair store that has the products and things that I need. Um, and I remember going to one in, in downtown Hartford, so like a place where there's tons of black people, tons of black women, um, and going into a hair store because I needed some products, it's been a while, um, and just being actively followed by the store owner. And I just remember being very taken aback at this because the store owner was of Asian descent. So that kind of just goes to show there's a lot of anti-blackness, not just in white people, but in Latinx people, which is something that I've really had to grapple with a lot, being half Puerto Rican. And my entire, my entire side, like Puerto Rican side, are all lighter than me. So they're all, you know, having to grapple with that. But then, you know, going to a store that where a majority, I would say 98% of sales at hair stores are from black women or black people overall. So to be, you know, how shameful and disgusting that is to be followed around by the people that are keeping your business running. Um, the only people that really know what hair stores are, let's be real. Um, so that was just my personal experience with, in terms of case nine. Um, and then in terms of case four, um, not specifically towards the Native American community, because I totally understand in that relation, but in terms of Yukon, just, you know, how sometimes that burden is put a lot on students of color, even black students, you know, having to be, you know, the speakers of our entire community. If I'm in a class where I'm like the only black person and we're talking about race or ethnicity or something, and automatically the microphone's handed over to me because I'm supposed to be the expert of all this, and if I say no or if I feel uncomfortable talking about it, then I'm at fault, so. Um, I totally kind of felt that one in terms of how people in these marginalized communities, we, it is not our responsibility to, and is to continuously, you know, do our spiel, do our, you know, educate others. Like, sure, that can be a part of it, but it's extremely tiring and exhausting to have to continuously do it, especially more in, like, relation to the UConn stage where we're students, like, we're here to learn just like anyone else. So it's a big burden. Well, thank you. I appreciate you all giving me your authentic selves and your story. So as we continue on, I want you to look at the two questions that are up. But I want you to see it from the perspective of the institution that you wish UConn was, the institution that you want to be affiliated with, the place where you would like to see our school go to. And we're going to talk about it for roughly 10 minutes. Please read with me. What do you feel are the greatest barriers to creating a more diverse, inclusive, and welcoming university culture? What concrete steps might we take as a community, as an institution, as individuals to combat racism and build a more diverse and inclusive campus environment? Again, we're leaning into our own experiences here and our own selves, so speak from yourself. And we just have this as a conversation, same thing, roughly 10 minutes. Anyone want to begin? So as an alum, there's so much to be proud of at UConn, but there's also so much to be disappointed in at the same time. So we need to do better. We should not have issues, it's 2019 people, come on. We should not have issues about race anywhere. But the fact that we do is an issue. And I think one of the first things that we can do is you know, have conversations like this. Hold each other accountable, hold your friends accountable. You know, if they say something stupid, if they say something offensive, don't laugh it off, call them out on it. And really, that's the first step of doing anything, you know, is really recognizing that this is an issue and making sure that what other people say may be funny, but it's offensive to a group of people. And together, honestly, just hold each other accountable and recognize that this is an issue. And only together, if we, by having active conversations, and having active dialogue is the only way to combat it. Um, for me, so to answer the first question about the greatest barriers, um, there's a lot of them, but I think a big one that isn't often talked about is the fact that this university was founded in 1881. 
Um, and so a lot of policies and systemic things have not really changed that much, and they were originally made and formatted to benefit white men. Um, so, and that continues out, and you know, obviously there have been changes here and there, but the system, the, the, the main roots are still there. Um, it's kind of, I always like to think of it as a tree, you know, like it, it stems and it goes super, it goes down a lot, but you can, you know, try to cut out pieces here and there, but it's, the roots are still there. So, I think that there's a lot of systemic things in this university that needs to be addressed, and I think that this conversation is a good start to it. Um, to answer more of the question about where I would like to see UConn or what kind of university I would like to see it as, I'd like to be able to walk around and see more people that look like me that might be able to relate to me, especially in the classroom. I would love to not celebrate having my first black professor like my junior year here, um, even though I'm a senior now, but it took until junior year to have my first black professor. So I would just like to see more people that look like me and again understand where I'm coming from and it's really especially to address culture shock that a lot of students, students of color, black students face, especially when we come from neighborhoods that we might be used to seeing a lot more people um, that look like us or, you know, I was just talking to my mom earlier about, it was the first, I've never been in a space or a room where I was been the only black person, the only black woman and, until I got to UConn, so that's just a shock within itself when I'm so used to being, you know, surrounded by people of my community, but also people of other communities as well. Um, so in terms of concrete steps that we can take, again, I think these dialogues are really moving into a great direction, but also just really listening to students because there are so many students on this campus that are constantly hurting and feel that we, again, have to continuously open our wounds and tell our story just to have someone listen to us or try to have people listen to us. So just taking our safety seriously um, and taking, you know, our experiences seriously because it, it's true and it happens. And I've been fortunate enough to not personally have many racist things happen to me on this campus, but that is not the case for everyone. Um, I can't tell you how many of my friends have come to me, tell me about racist things that have happened. And I just can't, I, I just can't feel more helpless and we also feel very small. So just kind of enlightening and lifting us up. I have a lot of thoughts. Um, so what do you feel are the greatest barriers? Uh, as she also just stated there, the barriers are systematic and uh, we would be not smart to think that it can be done overnight. I think some of the barriers that we're also facing is just, you know, and I just had this conversation with another individual to state that we're sometimes competing against each other. And because of that, we're not able to celebrate other individuals' progress, departments' progress. No, we're not able to really be authentically happy for other people. And I think that can affect the, the movement that we need to go forward. And I jotted some things down. We need to acknowledge that racism actually exists. Um, oftentimes, too often I hear, it doesn't exist. Um, or this is still happening, like this is the reality and it still happens all the time. So just be mindful of your language, think twice about what you're gonna say. And if someone is offended by what you say, be willing to listen and to hear what they have to say. Accountability, as Andrew also stated, we, you know, managers have to hold their staff accountable. Leaders have to hold their entire staff and departments accountable. Um, as far as concrete steps, we may need to do more dialogue like this. Trainings for faculty and staff, not just when you get hired, but probably annually, just as we have to do the compliance ones every year, probably should do some diversity and inclusion um, in things as well. We may want to define as a, as a university what inclusive excellence is, what it looks like, what it should look like on this campus, and I think that would be collaborative because we can't just focus on race. We need to think about intersectionality and how we are all intertwined with different identities. But I think the conversations begin with having a conversation and being okay with listening to what people have to say and calling people out, checking people. And you know, I think we've forgotten in society, and this is just my overgeneralization, how to be empathetic, how to just care for people, people to people, Let's start listening to each other. And you know, the theme for the university this year through student health and wellness, I believe it's Shaw now, is to be well, feel well, do well, right? But to listen louder. 
I don't think we listen loud enough and we don't listen close enough. And I think that's where change will begin because if we're listening, then we are acknowledging that it's an issue and we cannot invalidate someone's feeling. We cannot say that, oh, you shouldn't feel that way or you shouldn't do this. What is shouldn't? That should probably not be a part of any sentences that you have to say to someone. So I think it just begins with us having a conversation, us holding individuals accountable, maybe looking at some of the policies that we currently have in place and see if it needs to be updated, maybe a little bit, um, and changing our language. And I think it really, there's a lot that needs to be done. This is a beginning and it's gonna be a long journey, And but we all need each other in this room and even individuals outside of this room. So, you know, sometimes we get frustrated in our workplaces or in a classroom saying, why is change not happening? Well, what are you doing for your part? Because it's gonna take all of us to ensure that the individuals that are coming behind us are gonna need us. So your reference to the tree planted, what seeds are you planting to ensure that you can continue to water it and when you leave, someone else is watering it so it can grow and the culture can shift. If everyone is trying to water their own seed and plant their own seed, then we're gonna continue to have a whole bunch of hot messes. So um, I think that we need to assume that all of us are inherently pro-biased. I think that we, we are tribal people and we find comfort in us versus them. It, we find safety in it. So how do you fight that? I, in order to fight that, first of all, I think that we have to have an unwavering commitment and belief that diversity is good. And secondly, we need to, and this I'm speaking as an administrator, we need to relentlessly implement our laws and policies. And I think that far too often we become complacent in our search committees, in our PTRs, in our conversations, in our processes, and we need to be relentless about implementing it because it goes against our internal bias. And finally, I believe that we need to engage in difficult conversations. As a community, and it is really my 30-year experience here, 35-year experience here, we tend to shy away from difficult conversations. And I know that if you engage in them, sometimes you're going to be tagged and known as a difficult person, but always engage and bring up difficult subjects and difficult conversations. Someone needs to do it. I just want to say thank you to all the thoughts that are here. It's what, it's what makes me so happy to be at UConn. Um, but I will say this, I think we are our greatest barrier and I think we are also our greatest capacity to have hope. And we are our greatest barrier because of what Kazim was just sharing. We are. I think afraid to be uncomfortable. Um, it's easy to say, not it. You know, well, you know, I'll wait for that training to come out. I won't mandate it for my staff. Um, I'll take the classes where I know I'll get an A because I can understand the curriculum. And I wish for us all to move towards the hope of being uncomfortable and what that will do for all of us. And to me, those concrete steps are choosing to do what you don't know how to do, um, choosing to take the classes you don't fully understand the curriculum, um, choosing to ask the question you might be afraid to ask, choosing to not hide behind free speech in order to justify a joke that is hurtful to other people. That is what I think we have to be brave enough to do, that we have to be brave enough to walk into the uncomfortable spaces for those of us who are leaders to lead the way for our staff, and for those of us who are students who are already doing this work, that you know you don't do it alone. That it is the role of leaders on campus to share that burden, to lift that burden from you, because what Avalon said was very, very true. And it has to be our task to move us towards that place of true inclusion, of true discomfort, and of true diversity. Uh, let's see. I have a lot of thoughts. I'll try and I'll try and boil them down. Um, greatest barriers to creating a more diverse, inclusive, and welcoming university culture, I think, is willingness. 
Um, I think we have to be willing to look in the face of what this thing is and what this history looks like and address some of the narratives, I think, uh, to bring Brian Stevenson back into this. I think that that's a, a key point um, in talking about what this looks like. So in terms of talking about names on buildings and things around here, I think we need to muddy the waters a little bit. Uh, brother was speaking earlier about uh, the Dodds legacy and the building of the FBI and COINTELPRO and things that always get left out of conversations to, to put the shine on things. Um, so yeah, one step uh, would be the willingness to be more transparent um, and be more willing to pursue justice over profit gains um, and over investments. Um, and along those lines, I think that looks like transparency. I think that it's b befuddling that the University of Connecticut is a land-grant public institution with a private endowment that we don't have access to. Um, so who knows what that investment portfolio looks like. We can't possibly know because we don't have access to it. Um, so I think it looks like asking some of these tough questions and taking a tough stance to say, oh, what does the future look like? Do we actually give a fuck? Or are we just going to continue to pretend to? So. Um, yeah, that's sort of some of the concrete steps that I'm, I'm thinking of. And, and along those lines, it's thinking of what diversity and inclusion even means, because to me, uh, we haven't even desegregated the United States of America. We can't begin talking about inclusion until we can talk about why you have, like, literal cities in the state of Connecticut that are segregated um, in ways that I've never seen in the United States, and then address the fact that despite those very segregated cities we have, what is it, 3% black faculty, 5% black students, and so on and so forth. So yeah, we have to tell the truth about ourselves, and we have to be willing to tell the truth to ourselves. Um, and we have to be committed to justice. And I think if there's, there's one thing that bringing Brian Stevenson on campus pointed out is that we can do that, and we can excel at it, and we can actually, I, I disagree that we can reconcile the past and have racial reconciliation, but we can reckon with it. We can start to reckon with it. Um, and I think that only comes through telling the truth um, in hard conversations, in muddy conversations, in messy conversations about where the money's at. Um, so yeah, that's what I got. Um, to raise up Brian Stevenson once again, I, I think the, and actually tying in what Avalon said about 1881 and this being a university that was funded, founded by a white man for white men, and that we've come a, a long way from there, but in some ways we haven't at all to focus on education as social justice, right? That is a, that's, that's a key critical difference from how kind of education was conceived. And also fundamentally to listen to our students. I think listening to our students, uh, and in particular students of color for me has always been a guiding light to thinking about intersectionality, difficult conversations, structures of change, how to think about systems of power in the classroom, in the community, um, and our relationship with that as faculty and staff and as administrators. Um, it's not an easy shorthand, but it's one that I think is really critical for us to, to pay attention to listen to these brave folk here in particular um, as both the, where we're coming from and where we should be going to. <clears throat> yeah, I think about my personal vision for UConn in being a diverse and inclusive institution, and I think uh, with regard to diversity, it, personally, I'd like to see us reach a place where those traditionally denied equal opportunity to participate in the life of the university are represented in sufficient numbers that they're to prevent the isolation of mind and spirit, but also to build a sense of true community. Uh, on inclusion, my vision is an environment in which all individuals feel welcome and are appreciated for their unique identities and how that contributes to the life and mission of the, of the university. So how do we get there? I, I think there's an awful lot we can do as an in, in institution. Um, so a number of great ideas have been mentioned uh, already. We are an educational institution, so number one, it, it's the role of education in addressing the, the misconceptions that under, underlie bigotry and racism. Um, and, Beyond that, it's accepting the need for change. I think that was a Brian Stevenson theme, and I think that's institutionally what we need to do. And, and then, as, as individuals, I, you know, I said this at, at freshman convocation, and I, I, I think it's true, is uh, we need to have the courage to
to speak uh, for what we believe in and the courage to listen uh, and try to understand uh, those with views and perspectives very different from our own. And I think those will be the roadmap. All right, so um, thank you uh, all. Um, please join me in thanking this panel and this great conversation. <laughs> Obviously, having these kinds of conversations is difficult, it's challenging, um, you walk a tightrope, and you are all very brave for having that, uh, that tightrope act up here on a stage in front of everyone. So I'm, I'm, I'm really grateful for that. Um, but now it's time to transition from being an audience to being the participants, for taking that responsibility of constructing and envisioning the community that you want to have. So we're a little behind time, so we're going to make a, a, a bit of an adjustment to the second half uh, agenda. Um, what we're going to do is instead of having three rounds, uh, we're going to actually take out the middle round that had those case studies and instead focus uh, first on that, the, your personal stake and your personal stories, have you each introduce yourselves and, uh, and then uh, reflect on those, those initial stories about when you uh, first became aware of racism and racial identities and how they've manifest in your life. Uh, we'll skip over the, uh, the case study section and then go straight into hearing about your responses to these questions here about the barriers uh, to creating a more diverse, inclusive, and welcoming university and concrete steps we, we might take. Because at the end of the day, what we'd like to do is, you saw me up here, I was like scribbling down everything these folks are saying. At your tables are people who are going to take notes on what you all are saying. Because it's in this space of listening to each each other that we're going to generate uh, the ideas and the pathway for uh, for moving forward. Um, so at this time, let's give one more round of applause to our tremendous panel. And then I'd like you to turn to your, uh, your table. At your table right now is a table moderator or facilitator. If you are one of those amazing volunteers who have uh, facilitated, please raise your hand now uh, so they can see you at, uh, at their table. I'm going to segue to them. Um, uh, if you need to leave, uh, obviously you need to leave, but we ask you to stay if you can. We need your voice. This is actually the important part for you to be here. Um, they're going to begin uh, right now. So, and there are a couple extra seats up here if people want to come up. Okay, friends, as you all are going into round uh, one now, um, if your facilitators can lead you through the questions, and again, you can, as Glenn said, reflect upon the questions, and then everybody have an opportunity to speak. And again, we do ask you if you can keep to the two-minute rule, and I know it's unbelievably awkward. 
But that's part of what the point is here, that we need to be, again, as we've heard, we need to be proximate, we need to be in positions that are uncomfortable, and one of those is just simply being in a space where you are silent amongst people whom you may not know. So, and don't worry facilitators, we'll keep time up here, and so we'll be the bad cop to your good cop. So, anyway, off you go please, round one. Okay, if you can finish that thought up, and then we can move to the next person.